Hello, my name is Gozi. Welcome to Point of Care Nurse. We are talking about cardiogenic shock for the CCRN exam in this video. In another video, we spoke about heart failure. So when we talk about cardiogenic shock um, in relation to heart failure, they're sort of at two extremes. Heart failure is when we don't have enough perfusion to meet the body's needs and you know there are things we can do to optimize the heart to meet the body's um oxygen needs right cardiogenic shock is, the, is on the other end of the extreme of the continuum in in that case all compensatory mechanisms mechanisms have failed all the medications everything we're trying they're not working anymore in this case cardiac output is down to nothing that helps so this is where we start to have multi-organ um, failure and dysfunction so basically in cardiogenic shock the the heart is unable to pump effectively it's unable to pump blood out to the body effectively to the point where perfusion of the organs is inadequate Cardiogenic shock can be caused by an acute MI. It can be caused by chronic heart failure. It can be caused by cardiomyopathy, dysrhythmias. It can be caused by papillary muscle rupture. In this case, when the papillary muscles are ruptured, the mitral valve is no longer functional. It's like it's not even there anymore. It's a life-threatening emergency and it needs um surgery emergency surgery like right away if not things will go really bad cardiac tamponade is also another cause of cardiogenic shock so there really are uh three stages of um clinical presentation of cardiogenic shock it's the compensatory stage the progressive stage and the refractory stage so in the compensatory stage the the, the body is doing things to help the heart continue to maintain um, adequate cardiac output and perfuse the body adequately. In the progressive stage, the symptoms are getting worse, and but we can still treat. In the refractory stage, um, no treatment is working. The, the body is not responding to treatment. So we're going to focus on the compensatory stage and the progressive stage. In the compensatory stage, Patient will have tachycardia, the heart will beat faster. So the thing is, when you, you get questions on shock, on the CCRN, they usually give you vital signs, right? I notice they'll give vital signs, you have to look at the vital signs and now pinpoint the symptoms that the patient is having. So they'll give you a heart rate of 120. In my mind, okay, the patient is tachycardic. They give you a respiratory rate of 25. Hmm, this patient is tachypnic. You know, things like that, they'll tell you what the lung sounds are, they'll tell you what the blood pressure is. So you can then put together a clinical picture in your head to see what's going on with the patient and what the question is asking. So in the compensatory stage of cardiogenic shock, these are the symptoms that the patient will have. Tachycardia, tachypnea, patient might have um, crackles and some little bit of hypoxemia. Um, when we do a blood gas, the patient might be in respiratory alkalosis or early metabolic acidosis. Patient might be irritable, they might be anxious. We could have S3 heart sounds. The patient's skin will be cool, most likely, but but it, de it depends. Um, patient's skin may be cool, urine output will be low, and you have a narrow pulse pressure. So this, this, is, this is important. So they might give you a blood pressure. It's up to you to now calculate the pulse pressure from the blood pressure. So the blood pressure, the pulse pressure, sorry, is the systolic blood pressure minus the, the um, diastolic blood pressure. Now, in the compensatory stage of cardiogenic shock, the diastolic blood pressure starts to go up. Why? Because when the body tries to compensate for this um, lack of perfusion, the vessels constrict, vasoconstriction, and the diastolic blood pressure is an indirect indicator of, you know, systemic vascular resistance. So how 
how elastic or how stiff the, the vessels are. So if they give you a blood pressure, 120 over 100, or they give you like a change, the patient's blood pressure went from 120 over 80, let's just say that, to 120 over 100. Now you see the pulse pressure is narrowing. The diastolic blood pressure is going up, making the pulse pressure smaller, right? So a narrow pulse pressure um, will also be a, a symptom of cardiogenic uh, shock when the patient is in the compensatory stage. So something to keep in mind. We're going to now talk about the progressive stage of cardiogenic shock. Now, in the progressive, progressive stage, the patient is basically now getting worse. Now we're going to see hypotension. We're going to see the tachycardia, the tachypnea, and um, a lack of urine production. Uh, the tachycardia is going to get worse. The tachypnea is going to get worse. Patient might go to making a little bit of urine to no urine at all. Patient's skin is going to be clammy. There'll be discoloration. You can tell, you can look at the patient and tell that this, this person is not oxygenating well. They're going to start looking model purple. Um, patient will also, of course, have worsening anxiety because you, you, you know, you could feel yourself not doing well. You know, you're not able to breathe. Usually when, you know, when I, I have trouble breathing, I get anxious. My sister has asthma. When I see her have trouble breathing, I see that she's anxious and I'm anxious. So obviously the patient is going to be anxious, have some anxiety because they feel like something is going on here. Um, patient might also start getting lethargic. There, there's um, neural symptoms when it comes to shock because remember if there's a lack of perfusion to the organs the brain is one of the organs there'll be a lack of perfusion to the brain as well i had a, a patient one time well it wasn't cardiac i don't know what kind of shock she was having um it was an older patient she was in some kind of shock and she was her neurostatus was not there i think her gcs was like a i don't think she could open her eyes and that was it forget what her GCS was, but she wasn't doing good. After pressors and fluids, um, she she got a little bit better. She became more responsive. So just um, something to keep in mind. Um, patient could also have chest pain and um, arrhythmias. So basically in the compensatory state, the patient is still doing okay. The body is working hard to maintain perfusion. In the progressive stage, some of those compensatory mechanisms are not holding up anymore. So at this stage, the patient will need support. Now in the refractory stage, the compensatory mechanisms have totally lost their touch. They're not working anymore. And um, the patient is not um, responsive to, to treatment. But for the purposes of the exam, we're focusing on the compensatory stage and the progressive stage. Next, we're going to talk about treatment of cardiogenic shock. So pretty much um, we want to identify what's causing it. So let's say, for example, the patient is having a STEMI, right? So we know this is being caused by STEMI. The patient needs to go to cath lab, stat, as soon as possible. So one of the causes could be a STEMI. And in this case, the patient will need PCI and or fibrinolytic therapy. So usually before they go to cath lab, we start heparin. And then whenever the team comes in, they go to cath lab. The patient might also require, um, if, now if the cause is something mechanical, like a rupture, uh, like a ventricular septal defect or papillary muscle rupture, the patient will need surgery stats to repair the rupture. Now, if the cause is something like an arrhythmia, you want to correct that arrhythmia with antiarrhythmics. If the cause is something uh, obstructive or restrictive like cardiac tamponade, then the patient will need uh, pericardiosynthesis to, to treat this kind of cardiogenic shock. Another cause could be uh, tension pneumothorax. In this case, the patient will need uh, decompression and most likely a chest tube for this kind of cardiogenic shock to be resolved. 
Some other things that are used to treat uh, cardiogenic shock to improve oxygenation, you know, is vasopressors, um, positive inotropic support. So when we get these patients, we see their blood pressure is dropping. We say, dog, do you want to set pressors? So in this case, some of the um, medications that are given to enhance the pumping action of the blood or to enhance perfusion are um, positive inotropic medications such as uh, norepinephrine, also known as levofed, um, dopamine, milrinone, and dobutamine. Mechanical interventions can also be um, employed here. So in this case, we're talking about the intraaortic um, balloon pump. And um, ventricular assist um, devices can also be Use, but to increase the to enhance the effectiveness of the heart as a pump, the intraaortic intra balloon pump um, can be used. Now, in enhancing the pumping action of the heart, we have to avoid medications that will depress its pumping action. So, which means no negative inotropic agents and no vasodilators because they tend to relax the heart. In this case, we, we don't want to relax the heart. We want to help it work. We want to help it pump. So that's how we um, increase the effectiveness of the heart as a pump. We can also decrease the demands on the heart as a pump so that it's able to work better. So for example, if the heart has a lot of volume in it, it has to work harder to get that volume out. So there's increased demand on the heart. We want to do the opposite in cardiogenic shock. We want to make it easier for the heart to work. So in this case, we want to do preload reduction. Preload is pretty much the volume in the heart. So if we want to reduce preload, it means we want to reduce volume. We also want to reduce afterload. In reducing um, afterload, we reduce the pressure the heart has to pump again, so it's easier for the heart to pump. We want to optimize oxygenation. So then we want to put the patient on oxygen. We want to start mechanical ventilation, put the patient on ventilator so that the patient can get adequate oxygen. The heart needs the oxygen to work, to work well, to work better. Um, we want to treat the patient's pain. We talked about the intraaortic balloon pump already. That can be used in for a short period of time. And we spoke about the ventricular assist device before. This can be placed for a longer period of time than the IEBP, the intraaortic balloon pump. So this is how we can decrease um, demand on the heart when it's, when it's working um, in its pump function. Now, you can have a question on the intraaortic balloon pump. So it's important to know um, well, some basic things about it. Um, for the benefit of the CCRN exam, you just need to know what the pump does. It inflates and it deflates. You need to know when it inflates. You need to know when it deflates. So obviously, it's going to inflate when the heart, when the ventricles are filling. And remember, when the ventricles are filling, the heart is also getting perfused. So you want the heart, you want the heart to feel as long as possible, as much as possible, and for the heart itself to be perfused adequately. Then the balloon deflates right before systole. So it has to deflate and make space so that the heart can now during systole pump blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta and out into the um into the body. I also wanted to mention a few things about the intraaortic balloon pump, some of the complications and assessment, just in case it comes up in the exam. We know we have to check the patient's pulses and make sure that the limb that has the, uh, where the IABP is inserted, it's warm and that the pulses are palpable. The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that that limb is also immobilized so that the catheter doesn't get displaced inside the body. 
The second thing we want to assess is urine output. We want to make sure the patient is putting out adequate amounts of urine. And then if there's any drop in urine output, we need to notify the provider because the, the balloon may have moved and it may now be um, obstructing the renal artery where in whatever side of the, of the body it's inserted, whether the left femoral or the right femoral arteries. Another thing to keep in mind is that the, the IABP, the balloon could rupture. So if the balloon ruptures, um, there will be blood in the, in the catheter. Um, that's another thing to notify the provider about so that the balloon can be taken out. I think that's it with cardiogenic shock for the CCRN exam. I hope you found this content helpful. Please like, subscribe, and share, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye now.